The Death of Ilalotha by Clark Ashton Smith According to the custom in Old Tassan, the obsequies of Ilalotha, lady-in-waiting to the self-widowed Queen Santlicha, had formed an occasion of much merrymaking and prolonged festivity. For three days, on a bier of diverse-colored silks from the Orient, under a rose-hued canopy that might well have domed some nuptial couch, she had lain clad with gala garments amid the great feasting hall of the royal palace in Mirab. About her, from morning dusk to sunset, from cool even to torridly glaring dawn, the feverish tide of the funeral orgies had surged and eddied without slackening. Nobles, court officials, guardsmen, scullions, astrologers, eunuchs, and all the high ladies, waiting women, and female slaves of Zantlicha had taken part in that prodigal debauchery which was believed to honor most fitfully the deceased. Mad songs and obscene ditties were sung, and dancers whirled with vertiginous frenzy to the lascivious pleading of untirable lutes. Wines and liquors were poured torrentially from monstrous amphoras. The tables fumed with spicy meats, piled in huge hummocks, and forever replenished. The drinkers offered libation to Ilalotha, till the fabrics of her beer were stained to darker hues by the spilt vintages. On all sides around her, in attitudes of disorder or prone abandonment, lay those who had yielded to amorous license, or the fullness of their potations. With half-shut eyes and lips slightly parted, in the rosy shadow cast by the catafalque, she bore no aspect of death, but seemed a sleeping empress, who ruled impartially over the living and the dead. This appearance, together with the strange heightening of her natural beauty, was remarked by many, and some said that she seemed to await a lover's kiss rather than the kisses of the worm. On the third evening, when the many-tongued brazen lamps were lit, and the rites drew to their end, there returned to court the Lord Thulos, acknowledged lover of Queen Zantlicha, who had gone a week previous to visit his domain on the western border and had heard nothing of Ilalotha's death. Still unaware, he came into the hall at that hour when the Saturnalia began to flag and the fallen revelers to outnumber those who still moved and drank and made riot. He viewed the disordered hall with little surprise, for such scenes were familiar to him from childhood. Then, approaching the bier, he recognized its occupant with a certain startlement. Among the numerous ladies of Mirab who had drawn his libertine affections, Ilalotha had held sway longer than most, and, it was said, she had grieved more passionately over his defection than any other. She had been superseded a month before by Zantlicha, who had shown favor to Thulos in no ambiguous manner, and Thulos, perhaps, had abandoned her not without regret. For the role of lover to the queen, though advantageous and not wholly disagreeable, was somewhat precarious. Zantlicha, it was universally believed, had rid herself of the late king Archain by means of a tomb-discovered vial of poison that owed its peculiar subtlety and virulence to the art of ancient sorcerers. Following this act of disposal, she had taken many lovers, and those who failed to please her came invariably to ends no less violent than that of our chain. She was exigent, exorbitant, demanding a strict fidelity somewhat irksome to Thulos, who, pleading urgent affairs on his remote estate, had been glad enough of a week away from court. Now, as he stood beside the dead woman, Thulos forgot the queen and bethought him of certain summer nights that had been honeyed by the fragrance of jasmine and the jasmine-white beauty of Ilalotha. Even less than the others could he believe her dead, for her present aspect differed in no wise from that which she had often assumed during their old intercourse. To please his whim, 
she had feigned the inertness and complacence of slumber or death, and at such times he had loved her with an ardor undismayed by the pantherine vehemence with which, at other wiles, she was wont to reciprocate or invite his caresses. Moment by moment, as if through the working of some powerful necromancy, there grew upon him a curious hallucination, and it seemed that he was again the lover of those lost knights, and had entered that bower in the palace gardens where Illalotha waited him on a couch strewn with overblown petals, lying with bosom quiet as her face and hands. No longer was he aware of the crowded hall, the high flaring lights, the wine flushed faces had become a moon bright parterre of drowsily nodding blossoms and the voices of the courtiers were no more than a faint suspiration of wind amid cypress and jasmine. The warm aphrodisiac perfumes of the June night welled about him, and again, as of old, it seemed that they arose from the person of Illalotha no less than from the flowers. Prompted by intense desire, he stooped over and felt her cool arm stir involuntarily beneath his kiss. Then, with the bewilderment of a sleepwalker awakening rudely, he heard a voice that hissed in his ear with soft venom. Hast thou forgotten thyself, my lord Thulos? Indeed, I wonder little, for many of my bacocks deem that she is fairer in death than in life. And, turning from Illalotha, while the weird spell dissolved from his senses, he found Santlicha at his side. Her garments were disarrayed, her hair was unbound and disheveled, and she reeled slightly, clutching him by the shoulder with sharp-nailed fingers. Her full, poppy-crimson lips were curled by a vixenish fury, and in her long-lidded yellow eyes there blazed the jealousy of an amorous cat. Thulos, overwhelmed by a strange confusion, remembered but partially the enchantment to which he had succumbed and he was unsure whether or not he had actually kissed Illalotha, and had felt her flesh quiver to his mouth. Verily, he thought, this thing could not have been, and a waking dream had momentarily seized him. But he was troubled by the words of Zantlicha and her anger, and by the half-furtive drunken laughters and ribald whispers that he had heard passing among the people about the hall. Beware, my Thulos, the queen murmured, her strange anger seeming to subside, for men say that she was a witch. How did she die? queried Dulos. From no other fever than that of love, it is rumored. Then surely she was no witch, Dulos argued, with a lightness that was far from his thoughts and feelings, for true sorcery should have found the cure. It was from love of thee, said Zantlicha darkly, and, as all women know, thy heart is blacker and harder than black adamant. No witchcraft, however potent, could prevail thereon. Her mood, as she spoke, appeared to soften suddenly. Thy absence has been over long, my lord. Come to me at midnight. I will wait for thee in the south pavilion. Then, eyeing him sultrily for an instant, from under drooped lids, and pinching his arm in such manner that her nails pierced through cloth and skin like a cat's talons, she turned from Thulos to hail certain of the harem eunuchs. Thulos, when the queen's attention was disengaged from him, ventured to look again at Illalotha, pondering, meanwhile, the curious remarks of Zant Licha. He knew that Illalotha, like many of the court ladies, had dabbled in spells and filters, but her witchcraft had never concerned him, since he felt no interest in other charms or enchantments than those which nature had endowed the bodies of women. And it was quite impossible for him to believe that Illalotha had died from a fatal passion, since, in his experience, passion was never fatal. Indeed, as he regarded her with confused emotions, he was again beset by the impression that she had not died at all. There was no repetition of the weird, half-remembered hallucination of other time and place, but it seemed to him that she had stirred from her former position on the wine-stained beer, turning her face toward him a little, 
as a woman turns to an expected lover, that the arm he had kissed, either in dream or reality, was outstretched a little farther from her side. Thulos bent nearer, fascinated by the mystery, and drawn by a stranger attraction that he could not have named. Again, surely, he had dreamt or had been mistaken. But even as the doubt grew, it seemed that the bosom of Illalotha stirred in faint respiration, and he heard an almost inaudible but thrilling whisper. Come to me at midnight. I will wait for thee in the dew. At this instant, there appeared beside the catafalque certain people in the sober and rusty raiments of sextons, who had entered the hall silently, unperceived by Thulos or by any of the company. They carried among them a thin-walled sarcophagus of newly welded and burnished bronze. It was their office to remove the dead woman and bear her to the sepulchral vaults of her family, which were situated in the old necropolis lying somewhat to northward of the palace gardens. Thulos would have cried out to restrain them from their purpose, but his tongue clove tightly, nor could he move any of his members. Not knowing whether he slept or woke, he watched the people of the cemetery as they placed Illalotha in the sarcophagus and bore her quickly from the hall, unfollowed and still unheeded by the drowsy Bacchanalians. Only when the somber cortege had departed was he able to stir from his position by the empty beer. His thoughts were sluggish and full of darkness and indecision. Smitten by an immense fatigue that was not unnatural after his day-long journey, he withdrew to his apartments and fell instantly into death-deep slumber. Freeing itself gradually from the cypress boughs, as if from the long-stretched fingers of witches, a waning and misshapen moon glared horizontally through the eastern window when Thulos awoke. By this token, he knew that the hour drew toward midnight and recalled the assignation which Queen Zantlicha had made with him, an assignation which he could hardly break without incurring the Queen's deadly displeasure. Also, with singular clearness, he recalled another rendezvous, at the same time, but in a different place. Those incidents and impressions of Illalotha's funeral, which, at the time, had seemed so dubitable and dreamlike, returned to him with a profound conviction of reality, as if etched on his mind by some mordant chemistry of sleep, or the strengthening of some sorceress charm. He felt that Ilalotha had indeed stirred on her beer and spoken to him, that the sextons had borne her still living to the tomb. Perhaps her supposed demise had been merely a sort of catalepsy, or else she had deliberately feigned death in a last effort to revive his passion. These thoughts awoke within him a raging fever of curiosity and desire, and he saw before him her pale, inert, luxurious beauty, presented as if by enchantment. Direly distraught, he went down by the lampless stairs and hallways to the moonlit labyrinth of the gardens. He cursed the untimely exigence of St. Licha. However, as he told himself, it was more than likely that the queen, continuing to imbibe the liquors of Tassun, had long since reached a condition in which she would neither keep nor recall her appointment. This thought reassured him. In his queerly bemused mind, it soon became a certainty, and he did not hasten toward the South Pavilion, but strolled vaguely amid the wan and somber boscage. More and more, it seemed unlikely that any but himself was abroad, for the long, unlit wings of the palace sprawled as in vacant stupor, and in the gardens there were only dead shadows, and pools of still fragrance in which the winds had drowned. And over all, like a pale, monstrous poppy, the moon distilled her death-white slumber. Thulos, no longer mindful of his rendezvous with Santalicha, yielded without further reluctance to the urgence that drove him toward another goal. Truly, it was no less than obligatory that he should visit the vaults and learn whether or not he had been deceived 
in his belief concerning Ilalotha. Perhaps if he did not go, she would stifle in the shut sarcophagus, and her pretended death would quickly become an actuality. Again, as if spoken in the moonlight before him, he heard the words she had whispered, or seemed to whisper, from the bier. Come to me at midnight, I will wait for thee, in the tomb. With the quickening steps and pulses of one who fares to the warm, petal-sweet couch of an adored mistress, he left the palace grounds by an unguarded northern postern, and crossed the weedy common between the royal gardens and the old cemetery. Unchilled and undismayed, he entered those always open portals of death, where ghoul-headed monsters of black marble, glaring with hideously pitted eyes, maintained their charnel postures before the crumbling pylons. The very stillness of the low-bosomed graves, the rigor and pallor of the tall shafts, the deepness of bedded cypress shadows, the inviolacy of death by which all things were invested, served to heighten the singular excitement that had fired Thulos's blood. It was as if he had drunk a filter spiced with mumia. All around him, the mortuary silence seemed to burn and quiver with a thousand memories of Ilalotha, together with those expectations to which he had given as yet no formal image. Once with Ilalotha, he had visited the subterranean tomb of her ancestors, and, recalling its situation clearly, he came without indirection to the low-arched and a cedar-darkened entrance. Rank nettles and fetid fumitories, growing thickly about the seldom-used adit, were crushed down by the tread of those who had entered there before Thulos, and the rusty, iron-wrought door sagged heavily inward on its loose hinges. At his feet there lay an extinguished flambeau, dropped, no doubt, by one of the departing sextons. Seeing it, he realized that he had brought with him neither candle nor lanthorn for the exploration of the vaults, and found in that providential torch an auspicious omen. Bearing the lit flambeau, he began his investigation. He gave no heed to the piled and dusty sarcophagi in the first reaches of the subterrane, for, during their past visit, Ilalotha had shown to him a niche at the innermost extreme, where, in due time, she herself would find sepulture among the members of that decaying line. Strangely, insidiously, like the breath of some vernal garden, the languid and luscious odor of jasmine swam to meet him through the musty air, amid the tiered presence of the dead, and it drew him to the sarcophagus that stood open between others tightly lidded. There he beheld Ilalotha, lying in the gay garments of her funeral with half-shut eyes and half-parted lips, and upon her was the same weird and radiant beauty, the same voluptuous pallor and stillness that had drawn Thulos with a necromantic charm. I know that thou couldst come, O Thulos, she muttered, stirring a little, as if involuntarily, beneath the deepening ardor of his kisses that passed quickly from throat to bosom. The torch that had fallen from Thulos's hand expired in the thick dust. Santlicha, retiring to her chamber betimes, had slept illy. Perhaps she had drunk too much, or too little, of the dark, ardent vintages. Perhaps her blood was fevered by the return of Thulos, and her jealousy still troubled by the hot kiss which he had lain on Ilalotha's arm during the obsequies. A restlessness was upon her, and she rose well before the hour of her meeting with Thulos, and stood at her chamber window, seeking such coolness as the night air might afford. The air, however, seemed heated as by the burning of hidden furnaces. Her heart appeared to swell in her bosom and to stifle her, and her unrest and agitation were increased rather than diminished by the spectacle of the moon-lulled gardens. She would have hurried forth to the tryst in the pavilion, but despite her impatience, she thought it well to keep Thulos waiting. Leaning thus from her sill, she beheld Thulos when he passed amid the parterres and arbors below. 
she was struck by the unusual haste and intentness of his steps, and she wondered at their direction, which could bring him only to places remote from the rendezvous she had named. He disappeared from her sight in the cypress-lined alley that led to the north garden gate, and her wonderment was soon mingled with alarm and anger when he did not return. It was incomprehensible to Zatlicha that Thulos, or any man, would dare to forget the tryst in his normal senses, and seeking an explanation, she surmised that the working of some baleful and potent sorcery was probably involved. Nor, in the light of certain incidents that she had observed, and much else that had been rumored, was it hard for her to identify the sorceress. Ilalotha, the queen knew, had loved Thulos to the point of frenzy, and had grieved inconsolably after his desertion of her. People said she had wrought various ineffectual spells to bring him back, and that she had vainly invoked demons and sacrificed to them, and had made futile involtuations and death charms against Santlicha. In the end, she had died of sheer chagrin and despair, or perhaps she had slain herself with some undetected poison. But, as was commonly believed in Tassun, a witch dying thus, with unslaked desires and frustrate cantrips, could turn herself into a lemia or vampire, and procure thereby the consummation of all her sorceries. The queen shuddered, remembering these things, and remembering also the hideous and malign transformation that was said to accompany the achievement of such ends, for those who used in this manner the power of hell must take on the very character and the actual semblance of infernal beings. Too well she surmised the destination of Thulos, and the danger to which he had gone forth if her suspicions were true. And, knowing that she might face an equal danger, Santlicha determined to follow him. She made little preparation, for there was no time to waste, but took from beneath her silken bed cushions a small, straight-bladed dagger that she kept always within reach. The dagger had been anointed from point to hilt with such venom as was believed efficacious against either the living or the dead. Bearing it in her right hand, and carrying in the other the slot-eyed lanthorn that she might require later, Santlicha stole swiftly from the palace. The last lees of the evening's wine ebbed wholly from her brain, and dim, ghastly fears awoke, warning her like the voices of ancestral phantoms. But, firm in her determination, she followed the path taken by Thulos, the path taken earlier by those sextons who had borne Ilalotha to her place of sepulture. Hovering from tree to tree, the moon accompanied her like a warm hollowed visage, the soft, quick patter of her cotherns, breaking the white silence, seemed to tear the filmy cobweb pall that withheld from her a world of spectral abominations. And more and more, she recalled of those legendaries that concerned such beings as Ilalotha, and her heart was shaken within her, for she knew that she would meet no mortal woman, but a thing raised up and inspirited by the seventh hell. But amid the chill of these horrors, the thought of Thulos in the Lamia's arm was like a red brand that seared her bosom. Now the necropolis yawned before Zantlicha, and her path entered the cavernous gloom of far-vaulted funereal trees, as if passing into monstrous and shadowy mouths that were tusked with white monuments. The air grew dank and noisome, as if filled with the breathings of open crypts. Here the queen faltered, for it seemed that black, unseen cacodemons rose all about her from the graveyard ground towering higher than the shafts and bowls, and standing in readiness to assail her if she went farther. Nevertheless, she came anon to the dark adit that she sought. Tremulously, she lit the wick of the slot-eyed lanthorn, and piercing the gross underground darkness before her with its bladed beam, she passed with ill-subdued terror and repugnance into that abode of the dead, and perchance of the undead. However, as she followed the first turnings of the catacomb, 
it seemed that she was to encounter nothing more abhorrent than charnel mold and century sifted dust, nothing more formidable than the serried sarcophagi that lined the deeply hewn shelves of stone, sarcophagi that had stood silent and undisturbed ever since the time of their deposition. Here, surely, the slumber of all the dead was unbroken, and the nullity of death was inviolate. Almost the queen doubted that Thulos had preceded her there, till, turning her light on the ground, she discerned the print of his poulains, long-tipped and slender in the deep dust amid those footmarks left by the rudely shod sextons, and she saw that the footprints of Thulos pointed only in one direction, while those of the others plainly went and returned. Then, at an undetermined distance in the shadows ahead, Santlicha heard a sound in which the sick moaning of some amorous woman was blent with a snarling as of jackals over their meat. Her blood returned frozen upon her heart as she went onward step by slow step, clutching her dagger in a hand drawn sharply back and holding the light high in advance. The sound grew louder and more distinct, and there came to her now a perfume as of flowers in some warm June night. But as she still advanced, the perfume was mixed with more and more of a smothering foulness, such as she had never heretofore known, and was touched with the hot reeking of blood. A few paces more, and Zantlicha stood as if a demon's arm had arrested her, for her lanthorn's light had found the inverted face and upper body of Thulos, hanging from the end of a burnished, new-wrought sarcophagus that occupied a scant interval between others green with rust. One of Thulos's hands clutched rigidly the rim of the sarcophagus, while the other hand, moving feebly, seemed to caress a dim shape that leaned above him with arms showing jasmine white in the narrow beam and dark fingers plunging into his bosom. His head and body seemed but an empty hull, and his hand hung skeleton thin on the bronze rim, and his whole aspect was vein-drawn, as if he had lost more blood than was evident on his torn throat and face, and in his sodden raiment and dripping hair. From the thing stooping above Thulos, there came ceaselessly that sound which was half moan and half snarl, and as Aunt Licha stood in petrific fear and loathing, she seemed to hear from Thulos's lips an indistinct murmur, more of ecstasy than pain. The murmur ceased, and his head hung slacklier than before, so that the queen deemed him verily dead. At this she found such wrathful courage as enabled her to step nearer and raise the lanthorn higher, for even amid her extreme panic, it came to her that by means of the wizard poison dagger she might still happily slay the thing that had slain Thulos. Waveringly, the light crept aloft, disclosing inch by inch that infamy which Thulos had caressed in the darkness. It crept even to the crimson smeared wattles and the fanged and ruddled orifice that was half mouth and half beak, till Xantlicha knew why the body of Thulos was a mere shrunken hull. In what the queen saw, there remained nothing of Illalotha except the white voluptuous arms and a vague outline of human breasts, melting momently into breasts that were not human, like clay molded by a demon sculptor. The arms, too, began to change and darken, and as they changed, the dying hand of Thulos stirred again and fumbled with a caressing movement toward the horror, and the thing seemed to heed him not, but withdrew its fingers from his bosom, and reached across him with members stretching enormously, as if to claw the queen or fondle her with its dribbling talons. It was then that Santlicha let fall the lanthorn and the dagger, and ran with shrill, endless shriekings and laughters of unmitigable madness from the vault. 